So I, I'm Susan Singer. I'm going to facilitate the panel, and I'll briefly introduce our speakers in a moment. Our, our theme is funding the future of learning at scale. And we have colleagues from both federal agencies and private foundations with us this afternoon. And our goal is to have a really lively conversation that's forward looking because funders both learn with input from the field, but they're also in a position to really help us move forward a little bit faster. So we want to have this be a creative um, session. We're going to start with five, no more than seven minute overviews from each of our panelists about the programs that are within their portfolio so that they believe might be of interest to you and also a sense of what's driving that and where they see the field going. Then we'll let the panelists interact with each other a bit. I'll, I'll give them a guiding prompt for that. And then we'd like to take your questions. So that's what we're going to do for the next hour. And going from your left to your right, we have Lizia, who is acting as the division director for the Division of Graduate Education at the National Science Foundation. He's also the deputy division director for the Division of Undergrad education. We had the privilege of working together when I was at NSF and he's a wise, a knowledgeable um, addition to our panel. We have Mark Schneider, who is joining us as the director of the Institute of Educational Sciences in the Department of Education. He has a rich and varied background at the Department of Education in AIR and has some really innovative forward looking ideas with where IES is going, which I think uh, these are very exciting things to discover. Kumar Gard uh, is joining us from Schmidt Futures, where he's the VP for partnerships, but kind of oversees all the interactions amongst all the different funding venues to, to agitate a bit. And Kumar and I interacted when he was also agitating really exciting change in learning at scale in the Office of Science, Technology, and Policy in the White House a few years back. So he's got both the, the federal and the, the private foundation perspectives. So we're going to have our colleagues go in the order that you see them, left to right. Uh, so we'll take uh, some time. And Lee, why don't you jump in and get started? Great. Thanks very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm going to make a few observations about uh, infrastructure uh, and then uh, a fascinating topic, of course, uh, and then uh, note some funding opportunities, NSF funding opportunities relevant to learning at scale, I think. Uh, and then in the Q&A, which I think we'll have a lot of, um, I'll try to provide some guidance um, uh, on obtaining funding, uh, particularly because I know there are a lot of uh, fairly early career researchers in the audience. And uh, it was great to hear uh, that yesterday in the, the A-B testing uh, workshop I was in. And I think, suspect that was really true for, for um, all the others. So um, uh, let me start by saying I hope that uh, a couple of weeks ago you all um, witnessed uh, the, uh, we have a black hole in, in our own galaxy uh, in Sagittarius A. Uh, and that's part of the Event Horizon tel Telescope. And several years before that, a, the first image of a black hole, many, many, a long way away, uh, was also uh, imaged. Uh, but uh, now we have one that we can call ourselves. And that relies on infrastructure. And that's an infrastructure uh, in a discipline that goes back certainly at least to Galileo's first telescope. And so as scientists, we observe things. Uh, and uh, increasingly, we rely on a lot of infrastructure. Some disciplines, astronomy being one of them, uh, have a long, centuries-long tradition of uh, physical infrastructure uh, to, to do that. Um, so a number of years ago, NSF, and astronomy is not, not the only one, but um, it's, a, it's certainly a prime example. Well, a number of years ago, NSF recognized, National Science Foundation recognized that um, 
we, we do fund infrastructure as a foundation, but there was a gap in the funding. We have a longstanding program that funds, uh, it's called major research instrumentation. Uh, so uh, a, a group of chemists might need some sort of uh, nuclear magnetic uh, resonance machine. And so they'll come together and purchase one of those machines and use it in, you know, in, in, uh, for a group. Um, and so those, that funding has gone up to sort of the $6 million level. The other end of the spectrum, you have what a friend of mine calls the oil refinery projects. The large facility, NSF has a large facilities office. It funds the large uh, telescopes uh, um, all around the country, all around the world. Um, the polar, the South Pole Station, uh, ocean going vessels. NSF actually owns some airplanes. Um, but those are major, major investments. But that gap in between, uh, um, a lot of the scientific community uh, was also recognizing that more and more research uh, was relying on an infrastructure that sits in that in middle area. Now, six to $100 million, that's a pretty, pretty big area. NSF came up with a program called Mid-Scale Research Infrastructure, and um, it has two levels. There's the six to $20 million level and the 20 to $100 million level. Uh, I was asked uh, uh, several years ago to be on a working group for um, one of those two uh, levels that was the track, the level two effort. And uh, because the uh, assistant director at the time uh, said, was looking around and said, wait a minute, EHR, my home uh, director of education and human resources, doesn't have anybody on that working group, but it's supposed to be an NSF wide program. Um, I had, he knew I had some interests in, in educational technology, sort of uh, longstanding interests. So I, I got asked to be on that working group and they were already working on a solicitation and so forth. And I, if I can claim one thing, it is that I got five words into that solicitation. And those five words are science and engineering education research. Uh, and and they, they got into that solicitation because that was the, the, the point was that, that the education community and STEM education, because um, it's the, the S and Science Foundation, um, uh, has research needs as well. Uh, we're not as far along as astronomy uh, or other um, uh, other disciplines, but in fact, um, there's a tremendous opportunity, I think. And my pitch to the group, and they accepted it. There was no question. Uh, uh, my pitch to the group was that we are awash in data. Uh, the digital footprints left by uh, digital natives, your students, uh, and um, uh, using born digital uh, resources, that those, that, that, that data is available. I mean, we're awash in it. Many of you are involved in those kinds of projects right now. Um, so I, I, just to say that, the, the, again, the data infrastructure is, is a tremendous opportunity for, for uh, the field. Um, we're sort of new to the game, uh, but um, to quote, uh, there's a phrase out there that uh, you may have heard, it, it's called data is the new oil. And this was coined in 2006 by Clive Humby, a mathematician who was working for Tesco, the big UK supermarket chain. He was the genius behind, the architect behind the, their club card. But he's the one who coined the term data is the new oil. So this is not in there, you know, it's not a, not a new concept, but for education data, I, I think it's true. Um, so there are two funding opportunities to call your attention to. Uh, one uh, just came out, um, and I, Renee, I'll, I'll make sure the numbers get to the folks, and you can post them on, on the site. Um, there's a dear colleague letter <clears throat> that's called uh, Mid-Scale Research Infrastructure Incubators and Conferences for STEM education research with a focus on education equity. And we've heard a lot about education equity through the conference so far. Um, and it's using a mechanism that NSF has called a research coordination uh, network. It, NSF, it's a mechanism that funds groups of people to get together, different stakeholders. And if you read that dear colleague letter, if you're looking now, it's uh, NSF 22-085. Um, there is a deadline coming up in September, September 1st, Another one coming up in March 13th for the incubators. Uh, conference proposals are also invited in the Dear Colleague letter, and there's a target date for that, July 1. Um, the great thing about that is that Schmidt Futures, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Walton Family Foundation are collaborating with NSF, partnering with NSF on this to support um, these, uh, these projects. So I certainly encourage you there. There's a webinar on June 14th 
uh, a Zoom link to register is in that document that if you look at NSF 22085. So that absolutely uh, prime, this audience is prime for that. You know, it's a way to bring teams together. There's another um, uh, program also looking at research coordination networks. It's called FAIROS, F-A-I-R-O-S. That stands for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, Reusable Open Science Research Coordination Network. So the FAIR principle, some of you may know about that. That's about open sharing of data. Um, their deadline has already passed, but I, I'm, I believe we'll see that um, opportunity come around again. So those are two for sure, um, and we'll make sure that, that that information gets out to you. So I'm going to close there, turn it over to Mark. And I think it's a beautiful segue into what Mark has been doing at IES. Well, I'm, I'm not going to announce any funding opportunities <laughs> because they, they keep changing. And um, so, we, um, so I, I'm sorry to insult uh, NSF, but someone in the director's office one told, once told me that NSF stands for not so fast. <laughs> so um, it stands for actually not sufficient funds. <laughs> no, we have that. We have that OK, so anyway, um, so I just want to talk about the principles that we are uh, that we are looking at as we continue to invest in infrastructure, because that's, you know, the R&D, modernizing the education R&D infrastructure is uh, one of the clarion calls that, that I've made to my staff and to, and to, my, and to IES. So the, here are, the, here are the, the five principles. So one is data science. So I don't have to tell you what data science is, it's, uh, but we've been lagging. Uh, we have no permanent data scientists on IES or the National Center for Education Statistics, which is insane. Um, and we actually just created an office uh, within a, a division within my office, the, the front office, um, that is going to be for excellence in uh, education data science. We actually will post a, um, a supervisory data scientist position soon and uh, hire a couple of people into that. In the meantime, we actually have uh, data science fellows that, that have, have been showing up. Uh, uh, thanks to uh, Kumar and other organizations. Uh, John Whitmer, who was here uh, for the last uh, meeting on Tuesday, I guess, um, and many of you know John. Uh, so he, he's been, I think he's in to his second or third year with us, and we're bringing in other data scientist fellows. Uh, in the meantime, we also expect to be hiring data scientists. So that's number one. So data libraries. So this to me is a, <clears throat> excuse me, this to me is a really interesting challenge. So what we're talking about are um, ethical, representative, anonymized, large data sets that, um, that are uh, uh, made available for training models, for example. So we put out an RFI, it closed um, Monday, um, an RFI for those of you who aren't in the world, uh, request for information. We, we, a thousand people looked at it and we have something like 96 responses about um, here's my ideas, our joint ideas for what a data library looks like. The one that I think is gonna be the first out of the box is gonna be using the National Assessment of Education Progress um, data, uh, NAEP data, and we've collected over years, hundreds of thousands of student essays. So we know that writing is a, um, a declining art in, in, in schools, along with declining science skills, declining math skills, declining reading. But the, one of the problems with writing is that it's extremely labor intensive to grade essays. So when I was a middle school teacher, I had 150 students, right, between five different classes. Mm -hmm. And if I gave an essay, they weren't very good, but they required a lot of attention, a lot of scoring and like, I, I'm, you know, take a week to do them. So that violates everything we know about good education. Um, and, 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 you know, people need feedback, but teachers can't do it. So what we're, what we're trying to do is get a, a sample of about 40,000 of these essays. We're going to anonymize them. We're going to, you know, so all PII is stripped out. Um, we think we get like all of it stripped out, but, you know, maybe 99%. Um, and then we're going to do two things with them. Um, I'm sorry, the, the other thing we're going to do with them is we're going to tag them so that we have much more information than just a single score. So we'll know m much more about what the characteristics of the, of, of the essay are. And then we're going to probably do two competitions, which I'll talk about in a second. So the first competition may be a simple scoring competition. We've done that. We did that for a NAEP reading competition. 
Um, and we do, we're gonna do one for a math competition. So we're gonna do a, a, a scoring competition. I think we're gonna do this, but the more interesting one will be the build, the follow on, which is a competition for um, intelligent writing tutor, right? So can you train your systems against these 40,000 hmm. student essays to A, the first thing to, you know, so imagine as simple as getting the grades faster so teachers don't have to sit for a week and grade 150 essays, right? And you could easily build into like Grammarly and spell check already. So what other kinds of things can we build into a, um, you know, test? Um, and, and all of this has to be aimed for uh, student use, for classroom use. So we're looking at other data libraries. They have to be big, they have to be anonymized. Um, they have to be ethical, you know, so they're not algorithmically biased. Um, and, 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 and we'll collect them, we'll make them available. I think we'll just run more competitions against them as we, as we perfect them. So the third, uh, the third part, many people here know, of course, uh, we've invested in SeerNet and other digital learning platforms. We, we've done the uh, we've done the X Prize, um, which is I think four of the five people teams in Searnet are also competing for the X Prize. There are ten teams that are now in the test phase of the of the X Prize, a digital learning uh, uh, platform uh, prize. And the purpose the purpose of that the X Prize was to increase replications. So replications are fundamental, uh, and the way I envision replications are not you know they're the design of replications have to be to help us identify what works for whom under what conditions which is what is's motivating principle is and um, and you do that by replications so you in the X prize you you do an experiment you fail fast but you the ones that work you learn you replicate in different populations and ultimately we we're going to do this multiple uh, multiple cycles, uh, we, there's not enough time for that. But I mean, you could imagine how this works. You, you test, most things fail, some things work, then you test it in, you know, in, 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 with black students, Hispanic students, students with disabilities, et cetera, until you have much better sense of the targeted effects of, the, of, of an intervention. And, you know, so the first rounds of replications were the, in the standard model, like I call it, um, of, that IS has per, uh, perfected over the last 20 years, five years, $5 million failure. So then we, what we're going to do is, oh, we have like 10% of the things work. So we're going to do replication. And then like, it's going to be five years, $5 million. And most of the replications would fail. It, it, it just, ne it was never going to work. It was never going to do what I wanted to do, which was fail fast, replicate, learn, drill down. Okay, so so uh, so the digital learning platforms. So here's an, there are two interesting questions, and I'm going to pose them to the group. And and, uh, and and any of you who read my blogs know that I always sign off with a, a serious, like a serious. It's a serious proposal. If you have anything to say? Here's my email address. Write me. So so we're trying to figure out what what is the best definition for digital learning platform. Right, so we took five of, uh, we, we, we funded in CIRNET five of the biggest di digital learning platforms. They had 100,000 users. Um, but what, what are the components? Because we, we've actually funded way more than these five. We haven't even, you know, I mean, we're supporting these five digital learning platforms. But the question is like, we've also funded 20 different digital learning platforms. And most of them were just like bespoke, one off. And I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that. I want to either drive them into the SeerNet world, or I want to make sure that these are scalable, that these are you know generalizable, that these can support replications, um, et cetera. So we're trying to figure out like what guiding principles we can have that when someone comes in with a proposal for yet another digital learning platform, we say, sorry, you should go to SeerNet or sorry, we're not gonna fund this, or yeah, we, we don't wanna shut off innovation, but we, you know, we have to have some principles uh, about that. This, the second one, which is actually something that I think all government agencies are struggling with, and that is, you know, I call it what you want, but you know, digital exhaust. So, um, so learning, learn platform, right? I don't know if you know Carl Wachtanis. So he sells a service, a business service to thousands of school districts. And they want his, they want that service. So it's not like, you know, we, we don't have to go and beg 
a school district, they come to Carl and they hire Learn Platforms to do a business process. And in the process of doing that, digital exhaust is collected. So to what extent should we be investing in those kinds of things, those kinds of platforms that are business opportunities that are generating lots of data? And, and, and the amount of information, as you can imagine, that a, a, you know, a, a good commercial operation collects is swamps what we could get from other kinds of um, other kinds of digital learning platforms. So, but we need principles about how to deal with um, with with that kind of operation. So, again, any ideas there would be would be uh, uh, very useful. Um, so, we we I noted that we're running competitions. So, um, so competitions for me are like fast turnaround. They're actually way, no matter how much money we put in them, they're way cheaper than our standard model of five years, $5 million failure. Um, so the X prize is totally gonna be a couple of million dollars. Um, the, if, if you read my blogs today, we just formally announced the next two competitions. Um, so one is on, uh, and uh, many of you should be, should uh, participate in this. It's, one is gonna be middle school science. And the other one is going to be upper elementary school math for students with disabilities. So both of these are you know, critical populations, critical skills that are, that are lagging. So we're gonna run two competitions. Um, the prizes, there, there's a challenge component to those prizes. It, the competitions, it, you have to hit a certain uh, um, benchmark, which we are still working on. And if you hit that benchmark and you're the best in class and you hit that benchmark, you get $750,000. Otherwise, we won't give out that prize, but there'll be a first prize of uh, 150,000 for the best, e even if you don't hit the, the benchmark. So we have those two. I noted we ran a we, we ran a, a automated scoring competition for reading. We're going to do one for writing using NAEP data. Um, the the reading one was fascinating. We um, we gave a fifty thousand dollar. There's a fifty thousand dollar prize, not a you know, not a $750,000 prize. We got many applications. We did, in fact, um, award six people, six teams prizes. Uh, my favorite one was two students who were bored. It was during pandemic. They didn't know what else to do. They said, hey, we have some skills. Why don't we do this? Um, and they were, they were sixth. Uh, they, they made the cut. They were within the top six. And then we went back to all those companies, all the winners, and we said, how much would it cost you to implement this in the in, in the full uh, test, the full NAEP. One company came back with $4 million, right? And we said like, this, is, this doesn't make any sense. And they said, oh, no, no, that was a mistake. It was really $1.5 million. So we learned, I mean, there are many lessons in that, but the other lesson was when we went to these two kids and we said, um, uh, like, how much would it cost to implement this? They said $5,000. I said like, okay, what could you do for $5,000? They said, buy better computers. And, so, um, so anyway, uh, so we, 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 so we, we're pushing on prizes, competitions, because as, as my, one, one of my senior leaders said, why would anybody do this? Why would anybody do the prize? We give them $5 million to do the work and here they're doing the work without any money. And at the end of the day, someone's gonna get some money, but it's nowhere near the $5 million that they would get to do the work. And I was shocked. I was actually shocked that she would even raise the point. It's the point about competitions, exactly competitions, right? It's like to get to to get juices flowing, to have people compete, right? And and I learned this when I was on the X Prize jury. You get so much money for so little prize for such a little prize, right? So maybe I shouldn't tell you this because I'm going to discourage <laughs> you from participating. But it, but I mean, it is it, it's a wonderful mechanism, right? A wonderful mechanism. Schmidt Futures and CAG uses Kaggle all the time. We're probably going to do one of our competitions, um, not not the, the the big ones, but the 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 automated score. I'm sorry, the writing one. We're probably going to do a Kaggle. Okay. Um, the last one, quickly, is you know we're, we're fi trying to figure out what what the next generation needs to be in terms of training programs. So we, you know, 20 years, 20 years is not a long time, in, in, but it is, it's remarkable how things solidify, gel and ossify in government agencies. So we, you know, we keep doing our standard thing over and over and over and over again. 
And what we're trying to figure out exactly what kind of new training programs we need to invest in so that the next generation of, of scholars will look more like Ethan, the, the, the first person who spoke this morning, rather than me, quite frankly. <laughs> um, so, so, we're, so we're doing that. So again, so there's data science, data libraries, digital learning platforms, competitions, trainings. And the other thing is you, if you look at the IS website, you'll know that um, we are committed to something that's called SEER principles, the Standards for Excellence in Education Research. Uh, there's eight of them. We're about to announce our ninth one. Most of these are most of these are just basic good science, like pre-registering studies. But other ones are they, they, they've actually shaken up the, the the education sciences. So, for example, we require cost analysis. So most people in education sciences, you're you know you're different, but most people in the <laughs> education sciences come from psychology or sociology. And like, hey sorry, you have to tell us how much things cost. I don't want an effective intervention that no one could pay for, right? We have to know how much things cost. So the first year we did this, um, and we said this is a requirement. If you don't do a, a cost analysis plan, you are rejected out of hand, no matter what else is in your proposal, you're rejected as non-responsive. And um, in the first year, the first year, two thirds of proposals were just turned down. People like paid attention. So, so we also did training programs, we did webinars, we published guidebooks and everything. So almost everybody does, does uh, cost analysis and I mean, of different qualities, but the fact of the matter is they all know that you have to do cost analysis. So they're graduate schools training people in cost analysis. So, I mean, that's a, that's, that, was, that was fundamental. We have uh, another core components like, um, most of our interventions are like a bag of pills, right? Here's some orange ones, yellow ones, green ones, blue ones, go home and take them. And we'll come back to you in six months and you tell us, did they work? Well, I mean, try to get that through an IRB, right? But the fact of the matter is most of the education interventions are a bag of pills, right? So we're trying to make sure that people identify like the thing that worked here was the orange pill. And this dosage of the orange pill worked. This is, this, this is actually another revolutionary issue because then you start needing common taxonomies. So IS alone, we, when we started looking at our own taxonomies, we had 17 different taxonomies, 17 different taxonomies. So we're crashing them all in favor of a much more limited number. I'm not sure if we'll get to one, but, we, but this is the kind of thing we need. We need you know, common measures, we need co core components, um, and, and these are the, these and, and the last one. I'm sorry. I'll talk and then I'll turn. I'll, I'll shut up. The the other problem that we have, not again, not your problem, but in traditional education science research, is nobody cares about scalability. Right. It's just like I'm a assistant professor. I'm associate professor. You gave me money. All I have to do is publish some obscure article in an obscure journal. Right. And then I get the line of my vita and ultimately I get tenure. But we're an applied science agency. So if you invent something and nobody uses it, it's worthless. It, it, that's an overstatement. It has some worth. It probably helps someone get tenure. But the fact of the matter, it's not changing facts on the ground. So we are, we, this, is, this is an incredibly difficult problem because the alignment of interest of academics and an applied science agency are not, is, shall we say, not totally aligned. So we're trying to figure out how to how to insist on more scalability, so that you know. So the the first year I was at IES, I put the word commercialization in the RFA as an example of success. My staff like. I said, well, you you tell me, you tell me a better way to scale than, than a commercial activity. And so commercialization is one of the things we talk about now, but, but we are, we're embarked on a couple of years. We're now about two years into this idea of scalability. Um, and we're ch just trying to, you know, change people's thought processes. Anyway. Thank you. You've given us so much to think about. Let's move on to Kumar and then we'll come back and have a little exchange and start getting your questions ready. No, you take your time. Uh, I, I 
think this is like a pretty incredible panel because both me and Mark are just sitting here rolling around. <coughs> thinking about um, learning science research in a new way, in a pretty big way. So I'll, I'll, let, let's do this as a little bit of a game, and we'll collect ideas from the group. So we ran, um, the data is a little, it's not perfect, but we had a researcher uh, do a survey of 40,000 learning science research papers. And the question was, how many of those papers had an end size over 1,000? Who wants to guess what the answer? At least, again, the data might end up being off by a factor, but we'll see. Uh, one one hundred of <laughs> So what, how many total papers out of 40,000? Well, you, do, you can do the arithmetic. Right, he says 40. What, who else wants this? Out of 40,000 papers. Sure. 41. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Yes. Forty-two. Four. <laughs> uh, you guys are you guys are <laughs> deep pessimists. I, it's like an accurate crowd. So okay, I'll give the answer. So like again, the data is mixed, but it was like our best estimate right now out of that data set was 125. And I was like really surprised because I was like, you are analyzing 40,000 papers, and all you're asking is is the n size more than a thousand? Is the number of subjects you studied? And it was really small. Um, I think that um, a lot of my experience and work in this area, so Schmidt Futures funds a lot of science research in a number of domains. A lot of my work has been informed by time I was in the White House and this feeling that we keep saying this revolution is coming. We're gonna, hey, the fact that everyone's got a device in their hand, the fact that, you know, like every first three pages of N every NSF proposal says, Things are really different, which means we can do different things. And then I would like, whenever I interview researchers about what practices they use to put a research study together, they feel like they're like the exact, they're like, it takes an incredible amount of effort to recruit 40 kids. It costs us half our budget to get to a sample size of 40. So like, I don't know what you're talking about when you're talking about large. And so, a lot of what I think Lee has pushed on and Mark has pushed on, and I think where you all can really contribute, is I think we don't unpack the unit economics of how hard it is to actually do the work, right? So, uh, you know, like a researcher will be like, I spent three years getting that ed tech platform to return my email so I could design a study, and then the Brandon VP left, so I haven't been able to do it since. And like no one else has been able to unlock it. So that informed at least some of our collective work on how do we have digital platforms that are available and ready and eager and raising their hand and saying, hey, we're Carnegie Learning. We want to actually work with more researchers. We had lots of researchers say, you know, you know, a lot of ML research is just built around, is there a really good training data set available? That's what all the big companies do, right? Like they put out a large data set and the field sort of and that's how you actually drive the best people into the field. One, what are all the large data sets that the government is actively funding and putting out on lots of topics, like whether it's crop disease, whether it's other things, it's pretty limited. NIH does some, NSF periodically does some, but this as a categorical activity where we build large capable data sets that others can use is still like, oh yeah, we put out you know, I did this walk around at NSF, and I was like, how many large data sets have you put out? And it was like, oh, I think in our language corpus program, we put out a speech data set on this thing. But it is not a funding line that is really available. Similarly, open libraries, right? Researchers are like, oh, I want to build, what are the open tools I can build? I had this experience um, at AI Ed right before the pandemic, where Neil hosted a, a group lunch, and the group lunch was, all these academics saying, like, how do I launch an experiment on my platform? And everybody had a different hack. It was like, I use Google Experiment, and I launch my condition on a separate browser. And this person said, oh, 
everyone was, and it was like around the table, and, it was, and people were trading notes. And I was like, there's like no Optimizely or any, you know, set tool. And out of that came a bunch of work that Steve and others have done on how do we build more A-B tools. So I actually think that the biggest value people in this room can play is that the work is really hard. And if you hide how hard the work is and just like keep submitting proposals that say, I'm just going to ask really good research questions and I'm just going to do my thing, then like the funders are just going to keep being like, our job is to fund the next six good ideas, but to never actually stop and say, what are all the public goods we need to invest in so that you can actually be more ambitious in the research questions. And so you know, when Ken has to fight for money to develop common, you know, all these things have been fights and where like people are like, well, why can't you just, and so um, we've been doing a lot of work with trying to get, you know, work with obviously all the public funders, but also bringing a lot of the private funders along at this point. All the major science funder, uh, education funders now are starting to have education R&D infrastructure programs. But I do think it requires, like learning at scale in some ways is like, you know, was prescient in sort of building this as a community early. But I still think that like on a practical level, a lot of this stuff is early. So for example, just before I came here today, this morning I was asking my team, I was like, if a researcher wanted to know what all platforms they could run an experiment in, what, what data sets do they have? Who would you call inside that platform? What previous studies have been published using that platform's data? Is there like a wiki of this? And they're like, no. So I was like, even though we've been doing the work and there's all this stuff, there's no place that like a graduate student could say, hey, is there some existing platform I could reach out to? So like some of what I'm hoping both in the Q&A, but after I'm always happy to get ideas, it's just like the practical, I'm doing something that's working that more people should benefit from. Um, you know, Ben is a good example of this, of doing common things uh, for the field. But like um, that I think is gonna make a huge difference because infrastructure is invisible, but it's actually the thing that everyone uses to get their work done. And the fields that take the time to say, this has to be a core part of the spend, do a good job. So the astronomers fight over what instruments to launch, but they don't like just fight over direct funding for their individual research project. They fight for infrastructure funding and they make the case for that. So I do think that like, um, it, it's a very timely moment, but it's a moment where you have to actually like lean in, explain all the opportunities, both because you know we're gonna have to make this case to Congress and we, we do some of that too. And um, most of the most of the debate, I will just tell you, if you sort of interact with um, congressional staff and others, it's just around application. They're like, you guys are doing all this research. Why can't we apply it more? And I actually think that that's a perfectly fair question, but it actually sort of assumes like, like the current research is like amazing. But like instead, I like read through most of the papers and they're just like repeats of like, you know, there's like an, the 700th space repetition paper, but with 40 kids. And I'm like, I don't think we're giving people the tools to advance. We're just giving them the tools to run the next micro experiment. So I do think, and you get that frustration when you talk to practitioners and put folks in the field. So I just think that, so that would be my sort of charge back. I think it's like incredibly timely, but I think we're gonna have to like advocate together for what do we want and then, you know, Mark's not wrong, like he's very approachable, Lee is as well, and they've taken feedback from the field and that's why they've become advocates for this by listening. So I would definitely follow up with them uh, and I'm happy to be part of that for what do you think the field needs? And I think that's a, a great place. I'm gonna kind of frame a little bit of what I've heard and let you go back and forth amongst yourselves briefly and then open it up to all of you. So in the conversation, right, We we bookended it with the conversation about astronomers. And I think it's a really important point in terms of culture. And especially so many folks are early career, right? You're trying to establish yourself. It's a kind of, there's the, this competitive spirit that's built in with never enough resources. And yet what the field needs tremendously is collaboration. So every decade, the astronomy community comes together 
and you know, gently arm wrestles, maybe not always so gently, about what are the most pressing issues in the field and how can we all move forward to that? What do we most need in order to be able to do that? That's a very, very hard cultural shift. Learning at scale is a young enough field in its development that the field itself has an opportunity to determine how they're going to work together and how they're going to move forward. And what strikes me from the panel, and I find it very exciting and very refreshing to hear, is this emphasis on how important the problem is that we're all working on, right? Educating all learners in terms of public good. There aren't many more powerful drivers out there. And then coupled with that, the, the urgency and why are we so darn slow? So I, I mentioned the, the cultural fabric. There's been a lot of information here about, yeah, we haven't come together and we don't have the resources, the tools, the infrastructure at scale. And so what I'd like to do before we turn it over to you, because I promise this was not your mom's um, <laughs> grant panel, um, is to have the three of you just engage each other. So you can, you know, you can, in the back and forth, you can have one or two sentences and then you have to give someone else the, the airspace. But let's start with what are the things that you think are most pressing that would unstick us and let us really accelerate progress towards helping all learners. And you've, you've touched on pieces, so you can kind of pick your favorites from your list. And you can push back if you disagree with someone else on the panel about why you think your idea was best. Model what a decadal um, astronomy conversation might look like. <laughs> well, I'll jump in, uh, because uh, believe it or not, if you could look at, read the first line of what I've written, which I walked into here with, you, I did not create this. It says, good infrastructure is invisible. So Kamar, ex exactly in line with that. I mean, my, my father is a retired structural engineer and my mother's a retired librarian. So I think infrastructure was sort of always in the air and I, it was only you know, much, much later that I kind of realized, oh, maybe there's a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, but, uh, but infrastructure, does, it's, it, it, it only becomes visible when it breaks. And, and so we have to make those investments. NSF is making those investments through the mid-scale uh, program. Education has a, an opportunity. Uh, uh, the, the incubators are another place to bring the community together. Okay, you're uh, up that's to really nine important. sentences. <laughs> right? but, you, but you get more. See, if you use your two or three, you get more sentences. <laughs> Are you waiting for me to say something? Oh, or I already. Are. You're supposed to engage each other. It's yeah. a conversation. Oh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> It'll be a new life skill you'll have acquired this uh, it, Old dog, new tricks. Um, so we are. I mean, so all the things that I, I noted are really designed to just change the scale of the work that's being done, right? So, um, so Kamar's 120 papers. Um, I mean, we know that this is the case. We also know that small end studies are disasters, right? I mean, the, uh, how many times do we have to know that if, if you build a science on small ends, right, of social science and education science on small ends, you're going to end up with incredibly biased uh, results, right? You're going to end up with things that are true that aren't true, and you're not going to discover what's really true. I mean, it, it, I don't know how many times, how many times we have to rediscover this point. So, so the part of the problem is the way in which we fund research proposals. People come in, right, and they, they want to do something innovative, but it's like one person, you know, at, at some university asking for money to do something. It, it's, just not, it's just not a model that works anymore. But here's the problem. So um, we, the, biggest, the biggest single source of money in IS for education science research is our, uh, I mean, the, their, a grants, the, all our grants have letters after them, and the biggest source is 805A, and we're not running this this year. 
and we're not running the, the, them this year for two reasons. One is part of, part of the reason we're not running them is because many um, continuation grants have to be funded because they're coming out of COVID. And we, we had to spend more money on, on that. But the other reason we are not funding them is because I keep creating new competitions, new grant competitions. And they're the ones, the what we're creating are ones that are more reflective of these kinds of issues, the kinds of issues that you're talking about, the kinds of issues that Kumar has talked about, the kinds of these talked about. But here's the problem. The 805A is about $100 million a year. And it supports a, an industry, it supports an industry that lives on that money. And the fact of the matter is like many professors need that money for graduate students, they need that money for publications, they need that money for you know, young, young faculty need that. But the question is like, that is too, that's too traditional for me. Okay, so we are now up to like 20 sentences. So I'm hearing infrastructure scale, cost effectiveness, but also education's a legacy sector. I think that was really key to your last point. It, it, we're not gonna disrupt if everybody's unemployed and out on the street. All right, Kumar. I think one place to start is um, build from somewhere where things are working. So I'm a big believer that one place where we could get smarter on our, let's take those 125 papers. If there's a set of ed tech platforms or test beds that have been the key partners to generate these large end papers, rather than those platforms just kind of doing that as a, as a favor, whether it's on the private side or on the public side, government needs to, like we should be helping invest and say, hey, how can other researchers now start to use, you know, so for example, so I, I was reading a Stanford, you know, set of papers that came out from one of their education data science workshops. And they had this big study that was like Alex, NWEA, and a couple of researchers. But like nowhere in the study could I read who at NWA and Alex sponsored the study. So it was like, you would have to like do 17 steps. So I think one on the like list of requests for the, is like, I think one step is in places where big studies are getting put together, we have to praise them. We have to fund the, the work that allowed that to come together. And we have to create a drawbridge for the next set of researchers to use it. So like every time I come across a large study, I'm like, I now have to go sleuthing for like, who is the PI? And then what I will call them up and be like, I called this, the CEO of GoGuardian and they connected with this VP and this is how I got it. But like, I don't know, like, do I want to make all of you do that? <laughs> or would it be easier if it, as a, at least as a first step, we made it easier to make those discovery costs? And I think that would make, you know, I don't know if right now we make that particularly, if you're an enterprise and graduate student, a young faculty member, others, and you're looking for places to do this work, how would you find it? No, the hidden, the hidden infrastructure. Lee, why don't you wrap it up and then we'll open it up for yeah, questions. You know, Since you only got your nine sentences. Yeah, so a couple, of, I'm gonna to try to keep the nine words. Um, I, I have a, a couple of words come to mind, aggregation um, and sharing, and they're not the same, okay? And there's a, there's a culture shift that I'm gonna ask you all to, to undertake. You're gonna to have to take a chance. You're gonna to have to take a chance in your, in your research proposals uh, to advocate for sharing advocate for aggregation aggregate i mean uh, advocate for collaboration you know if you want to if you want to fund discovery and nsf has done that super well for 72 years you incentivize competition right to get the best ideas but if you want to if you want to uh, incentivize if you want to fund change and i think underlying everything that we're doing here is trying to change the system to get learning gains if you want to fund change, I think you have to incentivize collaboration, maybe coopetition, to, to, to take a, a word. And, and that's, you, you're going to have to take a chance. Because when you submit a research proposal, 
the review panel is going to be trying to think in terms of the next greatest best thing, right? And so they may not look particularly kindly at someone that's trying to offer a different way of doing things. But if an, I think if we have a critical mass, I think if we have enough people going in that direction and Mark and I and, and, and Kumar and, and the other uh, foundation partners that he's working with, you know, there, there, there's receptivity to that. You know, we, we can't change, we can't move the ship in, entirely all quickly, uh, but we, it, it feels like we're at a perfect storm. We, we have an opportunity to move in that direction. So. Terrific, so now we, we have some folks with questions out there. Um, yeah. And uh, as people are thinking of their questions, I'll just ask the, um, the presenters for the next um, panel, the next session, to just get ready, be on deck for when we switch over. That's great. Um, I really appreciate hearing all these ideas about innovation. One thing that I've observed about our field is that um, there are ways that the field gets way ahead of researchers. For instance, um, there's a piece of software called Naviance. Um, it is probably the most substantial piece of human capital software in the United States. Um, it's used by something like half of all high schools or some enormous fraction of high school students to determine to like make a major um, impact on how um, graduating high school students think about their post-secondary transitions. Um, the most cited paper about Naviance um, was done by a Harvard Kennedy School graduate student and it's been cited 29 times. Um, and there's yeah. maybe three other papers about it. Um, I, I don't know from any of your organizations where I would go to find funding um, to understand this immensely important piece of software. And I think student information systems, Google Classroom, I think there's a whole category of things which are not like transforming educational systems in some distant future, which are like major changes in our education system right now. Um, and I'm wondering what thoughts you have about, um, um, you know, accelerating our understanding of these things which are transforming systems. So, and I'm going to suggest, given the time, let's get all the let's get the questions out. There's at least one more question, and then yeah, you know you can choose stack. which one you want to. Better to stack. I agree. Uh, uh, question. Who else has a question? Anybody else have a question out there? Well, why, why don't we work I'll through this? I'll get Ken. So, I, so Ken, I think your point is true, but I think too often is used as an excuse. As in, I think it is true that you can, you can get really important uh, uh, insights done out of small studies, but I see tons of studies that are like, I'm going to study clickstream of 40 kids doing X. And here is now like a bunch of analysis I'm going to do. And then I'm going to make these set of causal claims at the end of the paper. And it like. Yeah, just a quick follow up. I think what we I need. Is, think it holds together. We need to close the loop, right? We need to get to those closed loop studies quicker, right? And they should be at scale. But too, I mean, the other side of this is too often we're stopping at big end predictions. Right. Where's but, the student uh, learning? So the, let me jump in on that. So the so one of the things that I think uh, all the education science research has to deal with is the is the incredible heterogeneity of the student and learner population, right? And and if you start, okay, so you you do an a, an end with forty. If your theory is really 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 powerful, like if I cut off your oxygen, you die. I need an end of one, right? Uh, but but most of our theories aren't that strong. Right, that's number one. And, and besides that, we have this incredible heterogeneity and we have to test in, repeatedly test in different populations in order to understand what works for whom under what conditions. Go theory. But none of our theories are like, if I cut off his oxygen, he dies. We don't have those. Clinics. I'd give him a plant to make more oxygen. But maybe, <laughs> maybe you have some ideas. But and, and let, me, let me just, the Naviance issue is really important. And, I, I, and we're trying to figure this out. And, and any, quite seriously, any input about how, 
So government agencies are very limited, and at least, I'm, I, I, let me be careful about this. So a lot of restraints on government funded research is self generated, right? And I mean, I've, I've spent a whole career asking people like, where's the rule, where's the reg, where's the legislation that says we can't do this? Oh, but you can't do it. No, but show me why we can't do it. And a lot of it just turns out to be uh, conservatism, scared, people are afraid to make mistakes, people are afraid to, you know, you're gonna get called before Congress and Congress is gonna say, oh my God, you did this, you did that. What about privacy concerns? All this stuff really, I mean, uh, some of it is real and some of it is just make believe. But we, we are addressing this issue, or at least we're trying to figure out how to, how to do this. Um, so again, any, you, you write me, tell me, call me, yell at me, whatever. But, we, but these are, that's a fundamental issue because all this data is there and we have to figure out how to use it for, you know, for, the, for the betterment of learning outcomes. And Lee, maybe you have some suggestions where Justin could look and then I'll just, as we, you know, I'm sure others may have questions. Now you know who the cast of characters is wandering around the meeting, you can snag them at coffee. Yeah, I, I, I would make a pitch to, to look at that mid-scale incubators and conferences, particularly the conferences, because if you get a bunch of people from the external community together, and maybe you write a report, a workshop report out of that, you know, maybe that's part of your proposal, the federal agencies will respond to the pressure from the field. Right, and so Susan alluded to the uh, astronomers. They have a, a decadal survey. Right, it, every ten years, and this big thing comes out, and it drives the field. It drives the funding agencies because the funding agencies will look. The community is telling us this. Right, so I think there's a real opportunity. It, it's an investment, though. It's it's an investment, and we're behind in that game. But there's a got we that we have to have a place to start, and and, and this is the time to start. So. Please join me in thanking our very provocative panelists. Thank you so much. <laughs>